All right, y'all. Welcome back to Make More Music, the podcast that connects people to music and one another. My name's Chris, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. If you're still quarantining out there, I hope you're doing okay. Um, hope this podcast brings you a little bit of peace and joy through all of this. Today, I've got a killer one for you with Rachel Ramback. She is a music therapist extraordinaire. She's done a little bit of everything, um, and that's why she's published this new book called Innovative Income for Music Therapists. And if you liked episode one with Tim Ringle, I think you'll really like this one as well because she uh, has an awesome work ethic and just grinds things out and ultimately just talks about lots of different ways that a music therapist can make income. But I think this translates to a lot of music and creative careers in general. So without further ado, I bring you music therapist, business owner, author, and rock star, Rachel Ramback. All right, Rachel, I'm glad to have you here. Um, when we were first connecting over your new book, we both kind of laughed thinking about the fact that, hey, I remember talking to you. Weren't you in that class? And didn't you interview us for a project back? At, and I was just thinking, I looked at my Skype conversation. I think it was like 2012 or something like that. We uh, interviewed different music therapists doing all kinds of different work in the field. So it's funny now, full circle, to come back and hear about all the interesting ways you're generating income, that you're encouraging music therapists to think outside of the box. And before we get deep dive into all of that, I would love to start with some rapid fire. Are you game? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this is called the quick six. There are some short questions, but feel free to answer as much or in depth as you want. Okay. The first one, I want you to pull open, whether it's your phone or your computer or whatever, I want you to look at your media player and tell what the last song was that you listened to. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's actually 22 by Taylor Swift. So on the way home from Solid. <laughs> picking up my kids from school, we normally rotate between a few favorites. So we've got either the Taylor Swift Essentials playlist and Apple Music or Frozen 2, of course. Or um, the mm, Curious the George, unknown. yes, Into the Unknown. That's that's a favorite. Um, the Curious George soundtrack um, that Jack Johnson did. I think mm. it's from like 2006, but it's amazing. I love that. Um, so do yeah. my kids. So that's kind of our rotation. So Taylor Swift won out today. That was always one of my favorite songs to use in the hospital. The Upside Down. Yes, uh, I love that a one. Great song to use ISO principle and. Oh, bring it yeah. down a notch. It's got some jazzier chords. Yes, it does. So cool. Um, this can be as simple or as philosophical as you want to take it. But if you were an instrument, what would you be? Ooh, ooh, that's fun. Hmm. I think I would say a ukulele, not just because I love to play the ukulele, but it's pretty cheerful and upbeat and it's everybody likes it <laughs> for the most yeah. part um it's friendly so i would i would go with the ukulele i think i heard a statistic recently that the ukulele is like the fastest growing acoustic instrument market in all music instrument manufacturing Oh, I believe it a hundred percent. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I um, have seen just an explosion at my studio. So we offer music therapy services, but we also teach typical lessons. And I would say ukulele is right up there with piano voice and guitar lessons right now. That's awesome. Um, all right. Next one is could be anything, but what is something that's been inspiring you recently? Mm. This may sound a little bit cheesy, but I would have to say my kids just because it's so much fun to see their creativity just pouring out mm. and they have no judgment and they don't care what anybody else thinks. They will just sit down and 
do artwork and make these little creations and put on these plays. And it's, it is really inspiring because I'm, I'm always second guessing myself and my creativity and Mm. the way that it's manifesting. So to see these kids just do it unabashedly and without any fear of being judged whatsoever, that is just really refreshing to me. So I'd say my kids. I think that's totally fair. I'm a sucker for being a dad. So I I think that's all fair game. Yeah. Um, what, what, oh, this will be good since you just wrote this book about generating, uh, different lines of income. So what is a pro tip or a hack that you practice that you feel like people should know about people should do this in their life can be anything. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, you're opening up the floodgates here. Oh (laughs) gosh. Okay. I would say. For me, it's, this is kind of really, really general, but having a really solid handle on your calendar and your schedule, this has been a game changer for Mm. me. And I use a tool called Trello. For anybody that's read my book, I think I mentioned Trello about seven or eight times in the book, but it is literally, (laughs) (laughs) it is how I run my life. I have Um, I have a board that's for my current week and each day has its own list and every single task or appointment or meeting or session or class that I have has its own card. So then within that card, I can make notes, I can do prep work and um, just jot things down that I need to remember for later. I make my um, monthly session plan lists in there. I do everything in Trello. I mean, it's it's so great because I can access it from my computer, from my iPad, from my phone, mm. and it's just all right there at my fingertips. And so every day, there are a million different things that I need to do spread out over my different businesses mm. and the projects that I have going on, but it's all right there in front of me, and I've got it just very um, visually laid out. So that's been honestly, what, what keeps me running. That's awesome. You are not the first person that's mentioned calendars and time management, but I haven't heard of Trello. So that's really cool. Oh yeah. I love it. Um, two more. What is your go-to junk food? Ooh, well, normally I would say candy. I love sour candy. Um, like Sour Patch Kids and Sour Gummy Worms and Gummy Bears. But I have been trying to avoid refined sugar since the beginning of the new year. And so I haven't really had mm. any candy. And I'm honestly not missing it. I think once you once you cut it out of your diet intentionally, it's, I don't know, it, it's interesting. It hasn't been nearly as hard as I thought it would be. So now that I'm not... Mm eating refined sugar, I would say, um, hmm, maybe like chips and guacamole. Does that count as junk food? Ooh, yeah, that sounds great. (laughs) It is delicious. And I feel like avocados are, and I make, I don't know if I could necessarily count it as guacamole because I literally just take an avocado and I mash it up with some lime juice, salt and pepper, some cayenne pepper, and um, put some red pepper flakes in it and then just eat it with, that's what actually what I had for dinner tonight was that with some crackers. So, but I kind of consider that junk food. So we'll go with that. Sounds great to me. I'm all in and I'm okay. hungry again, even though I had pizza and I'm doing solid. Oh, but, sorry. <laughs> uh, lastly, it's okay. It'll be all right. What is a uh, person, project, or an organization that you feel like deserves being lifted up with a shout out? Ooh, okay. I have one. So recently on Instagram, well, I guess a, a few months ago, I started following mm-hmm. um, a music therapist. I think she's from Canada. Her name is Haley Can or Khan. Hmm. Um, And she wrote this book, this children's book called Mandy's Mom, the Music Therapist, which I just thought was so cool. I saw you post about that. Yes, I did. I I got my copy in the mail a couple of weeks ago and I posted on Instagram. 
I just thought it was so cool that I could read this book to my kids that helps explain what I do as my job. I mean, they see certain facets of it, but I don't think they fully grasp what a music therapist does. So having it in illustrated form that I could read to them was just so great. And I think that's such a nice little resource for anybody, really, and just for for getting across what a music therapist does to children. So I have to shout her out. Um, Let me look her up really quick on Instagram so I can give you her. um, Yes, MTA Haley. M-T as in music therapy. M-T-A Haley. H-A-Y-L-E-Y. That's her Instagram handle. But go check it out and check out her book. It's just so, so well done. Beautiful um, illustrations. And the story is really cute, too. Good gift for the music therapist in your life. Yes. Um, So I got this book for Father's Day last year. And this could be you could you could put this on your radar for this year. Okay. My wife uh, did this personalized book where you sent in, I think it was a picture of our daughter and and a picture of me. And I think she like filled out a survey about the types of things. And it's called when Marley grows up and it's a book about all the things that my daughter could be when she grows up, but it's the story is framed around an illustration of me at the beginning and at the end, like, Hey, before you wake up for your day, I hope you're dreaming of all the things you could be when you grow up. And it was like, oh it is, my it gosh, is awesome. that's amazing. I'll send you the link to it. Yeah. And yeah. you'll win Father's Day. So please do, because uh, I'm totally getting that for my husband. That's cool. amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And I don't think it was like crazy expensive or anything too. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll send you that. But so now that we've kind of rocked through these rapid fire, I want to go back all the way to the beginning and think about when you were a young child, what were some of your first musical memories? Oh, I the one that stands out the most for me was listening to Wilson Phillips in the car with my mom and us, us singing it together and harmonizing. And I just remember it's nothing that I was ever taught. It just kind of started happening where I could just harmonize the songs. And I remember my mom saying, like, how do you – know how to do that. And I would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just doing it. But that's really my earliest memory at like (laughs) five and six years old, singing along to Wilson Phillips, hold on for one more day. I just think of bridesmaids now when I think of Wilson Phillips. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, But so five and six, you're harmonizing in the car and then what does it look like what instruments are you learning do you, what you know are you in band or choir and how do you get involved in music as a kid and a teenager and growing up yeah i started piano lessons around age 5 i was 5 when i started piano i wasn't super into music other than i really liked to sing but i didn't necessarily think i was talented or that it was something i wanted to pursue seriously Um, I really disliked going to piano lessons. I was a horrible piano student. (laughs) My mom didn't really force me to to practice, which I'm I'm thankful for. Um, But I kept taking the lessons all through grade school, middle school, high school. And I didn't like practicing anything that my teachers were teaching me. I really just liked to do my own thing and kind of play stuff that interested me and So I got pretty good at playing by ear and just kind of figuring things out. And on the technical side, I wasn't great. My teachers would always reprimand me about my fingering and um, rhythm and reading reading the notes. I just wasn't great with all of that. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got to high school and started singing seriously, that really helped with with getting the musical foundations down. Um, But... It wasn't until probably, let's see, sixth grade that I realized I really loved singing and I wanted to do that on a more serious basis. So I started trying out for musicals and participating in choir at school. And then all through high school, music was my life. I was in show choir. I did community theater, school theater, basically anything that involved singing, I was doing it. 
That's awesome. What were your some of your favorite shows that you were a part of in high school and stuff? Oh, um, my sophomore year, we did You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, which was super fun. Um, my senior year, we did mm. Bye Bye Birdie, and I played Rosie, which that was kind of like the best way to go out of high school playing that role. Um, so those yeah. are my two favorites. Oh, my junior year. My junior year, we did Schoolhouse Rock Live. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, it was a little ridiculous. That was probably my least favorite. Uh <laughs> But the rest of them were pretty fun. Oh, I love Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, I mean, the songs are fun. I, I don't know that show specifically, but I love Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah. The songs are fun. I will say that. But the musical was just, I felt like it was very juvenile. Like for our costumes, we wore khaki pants that were from Walmart. And not that there's anything wrong with Walmart, but that was literally our costume <laughs> was khaki pants from Walmart and then like a t-shirt that said Schoolhouse Rock Live on it. So that was just the icing on the cake. <laughs> but oh, I did in sophomore like, year. I'm glad I have one more year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I had that one redeeming year at the end. Um, my sophomore year, we I did um, The Sound of Music at a community theater and I got to be one of the Von Trapp children. And so that was super fun. That was right up there with my highlights. Mm -hmm. I was, let's see, I was 16, but I looked like I was about 12. So I played Louisa. The I think she's the second youngest girl or the yeah. second oldest girl. So what part of the country did you grow up? I was born and raised in central Illinois and I live here today. Oh, great. So uh, I think I remember reading that you made a jump to, I know this because I I worked and lived in Winter Park and then Orlando. So you went to Rollins, right? I did. Yeah. I remember, I think we heard that when maybe we interviewed you for school and it clicked once I was down there. I was like, oh, that's the school, which is Mr. Rogers school as well. So yes, actually, uh, this is a fun little piece of trivia, but Mr. Rogers um, nephews are both well, one of them I know is still there, Dr. Daniel Crozier. He was my theory oh, wow. professor. And he was also my advisor. And um, so he was he's on the faculty at Rollins. And then my piano instructor, and he also taught a couple of other classes, Alan Morrison, he's like a world renowned organist. Um, he was doing a residency at Rollins during the time that I was there. So I got to have two of Mr. Rogers' nephews as professors, which was amazing. Are they like even half as nice as oh my the gosh. TV Mr. Rogers? Yes, they are like carbon copies, especially D Dr. Crozier. I mean, people loved being in his class just because it was like Mr. Rogers personified. Mm -hmm. And it was so fun. He's a great teacher. I just imagine the teacher walking in, changing his shoes, getting you ready for the class. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, you head down to Winter Park, and is that a – that wasn't a music therapy school, right? No, so no. Much, I don't think. So what was that path? How did you even decide, I'm going to college for music? Obviously, you're really involved in high school. Was that just, like, obvious to you, or – It was wasn't. No, no. So I – had this real crisis at the end of high school, even halfway through my senior year, I was very torn between whether I was going to pursue journalism or music and journalism was winning out. I applied to um, Northwestern and Wash U and a few other schools for journalism. And I got into those schools. So I was thinking, okay, like this is my path. But then I had professor or teachers and, and family saying, well, you know, you might want to consider music too. just, you know, weigh all your options. So I applied to a few of the other schools for their music programs. Rollins was one of them. And when I went down to Rollins for my, for my interview and my audition, my mom and I, and then the head of the music program and one of the other music professors, they were all in the room and after I did my audition, um, <laughs> we basically sat down and um, my mom said, you know, what kind of scholarship 
opportunities are there because that's going to determine whether or not this is a possibility. Because my parents had basically said, we'll pay for your college tuition as long as it costs about the same as in-state tuition. And obviously going to a private liberal arts school in Winter Park, Florida, in Winter yeah. Park, Florida yeah, that is not going to equate. So, um, so my mom asked that question and the head of the program said, well, how much do you need? And I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just just thinking about it because it was such a defining moment. And so my mom gave him the number and he said, okay, let's do it. And that for me, yeah, it kind of just, it's one of those things where journalism felt safe and music felt really, really scary because there were so many just unknowns and it's such a, it's just such a leap. And in that moment, I felt like, wow, these people have faith in me. So I might as well have some faith in myself. And So yeah, that gave me the courage to jump in. And I went as a vocal performance major. I had no knowledge of music therapy whatsoever, had never heard of it in my life. And I, my goal in life was to perform at Disney. So that's kind of what I was was about to ask. Did you do some (laughs) Disney performing while you were down there? I actually didn't. No, I got down there and I started the program and it was very heavily classically based. So it was Mm. classical and opera as so many music programs are, which was okay. But I kind of went through a little bit of a crisis of, well, I'm learning opera. This is great, but what am I going to do with this? And really, do I even like singing this music? Because I really, I didn't, I, it wasn't for me. And I felt like I was getting a really solid foundation with learning that material, but I knew that it, that wasn't going to be the end for me as far as performing went. And, you know, the Disney thing, it was kind of like this thing that felt really possible before I got there. And then I got there and I was like, oh, I don't know about that. That seems really, really hard. And I heard stories from other people that went and tried it. And it just didn't seem like it was all that it was cracked up to be. So I never pursued the Disney thing. But um, in my sophomore year... I came to the head of the program, the same guy that had offered all of that scholarship money to me. And I said, you know, I don't know if vocal performance is the path for me. And we, at that same time, I was in a music class where we were exploring different careers in music and we had to choose one and write a paper about it. And Mm. so I just randomly did a Google search, like careers in music. And (laughs) all of a sudden, this thing called music therapy pops up. And I'm like, what is this? So I keep reading about it. I'm scrolling through. I'm reading all of these articles. And this was 2002, I want to say. So, I mean, it was still, you know, there wasn't a whole lot on the internet about it. But I called my mom and I said to her, mom, I have to tell you about this thing called music therapy. And she said, Rachel, you will never believe this, but I got a scholarship to Maryville University, which is, I think, the first university that had a music therapy program in the United States. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that, but um, it's in St. Louis, and we Mm -hmm. live in in Springfield, Illinois, so it's about 90 minutes away. Um, But she told me I that was almost what I did. I got a full scholarship to go do that, do music therapy at Maryville. And I decided to stay um, with your dad um, in Illinois. And she said, this is just crazy. Like you have to look into this. So (laughs) I, I did. I went back to my professor that I had had that conversation with. And he said, oh, you know, I know a music therapist down here in Orlando. I can put you in touch with her. And I said, yes, please do. So I ended up job shadowing her a few times. She was in private practice. And I remember I went to a session with her at a, um, at a a senior center and I was just floored by how she was able to use music and to connect with all these people. And you could clearly see that they were getting so much out of it. Mm. And it was just one of those really, um, defining moments that you hear about music therapy where you just see it in action and you see the magic happening. And, um, so I, I told my professor, I said, this is what I want to do. How can I finish this degree as quickly as possible so that I can go do music therapy? Because there obviously wasn't a music therapy program there. 
So I went and met with my advisor, Dr. Crozier, that I mentioned earlier, and we sat down and worked out this insane schedule. This was the first semester of my sophomore year. So I'd only been there for three semesters and I'm already planning my exit strategy. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) I know. So needed. (laughs) I know. So we came up with this schedule where I ended up taking 32 credit hours per semester for those next um, couple semesters. And I was able to graduate a year and a half early. And Uh, (laughs) and I came back to Illinois. I got a a full assistantship to go to grad school at Illinois State University. And so I spent, um, I, I graduated in December. So I came home and worked and saved some money for that that semester in between and then went to ISU, did my degree program in two years. And it was so funny. All these grad students that were in the program with me, they were all a little bit older. A lot of them were international students and some of them had kids and a lot of them were married and they kept asking me like, how old are you? Like what? Cause I was only 21. And um, so it was, it was a very interesting experience not having had that full four years of college and then going to grad school and kind of missing a lot of that. But it was so worth it because I was just ready. I I loved the concept of music therapy. I loved everything that I had read, that I had heard, that I had seen through observation. And so, yeah, that's kind of the music therapy origin story for me. So you finished the bachelor's and the master's in four and a half years or what was it? Five and a half years? Four and a half years. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is like a sprint. That yeah. It's one Good of those things. <laughs> Thanks. It's where one of those things where you look back and you're like, well, how, how exactly did I do that? I'm not quite sure, but it, it just goes to show you that when you're passionate enough about something, you can make it happen. And I was ready to be a music therapist. And so I somehow made it happen. Well, you talked about that aha moment a little bit about music therapy. What is it that at the time and even still now are those things that just align with you in a way that you're like, yes, this is why this is such a part of me and how you grew to be so passionate that you literally sprinted through degrees to be able to do it. Yeah, I have a really personal connection with music therapy. Shortly after um, my graduate, it might have been during my graduate program. I can't remember the timeline exactly, but my grandmother was diagnosed with um, early Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. and she, she, um, the disease took over pretty quickly. I mean, it, it was less than a couple of years before um, she needed to go into um, a senior living center and really just lost all of her memory of her family and really withdrew from life in general and and just wanted to be in her room sleeping in the dark all the time. And I remember going to visit her with my parents and it was right around Christmas time and I hadn't seen her for a while and it was it was really hard to see her. So, um, my dad said, you know, why don't you bring your guitar and just see if maybe that helps because he had noticed that she would sing sometimes. She was a big Mm -hmm. fan of Neil Diamond and she would sometimes sing like Neil Diamond songs and Frank Sinatra songs. And that was really the only thing that she still had. And she was very, very advanced in her disease. And so he said, just try it, you know, and see what happens. So we went to the home and she was in her bedroom and didn't want to come out, refused to come out. So I just kind of sat at the edge of the bed and started playing and I just sang some Christmas songs. And all of a sudden it was like, she came to life. And not only that, but she wanted to come out of her room. She wanted to go into the, the bigger recreational room where some of the Mm. other residents were And I sat that day and I played Christmas songs for about an hour and a half with my grandma and a bunch of other people with dementia. And I I never had an experience like that in my life up until that moment 
where I felt like I was living my purpose and I was, it was, it was amazing. And the fact that that, that is one of the last memories that I have with my grandma, knowing that she was able to even get just a small glimpse of Mm. what I would go on to do with my life down the road is really powerful for me because I mean, she didn't get to see any of the things that I have done. She didn't get to meet my kids. She didn't get to, to really enjoy any of the music that I made in high school and, um, and afterwards because her disease took over, but that, that was just a really powerful moment and something that has stuck with me and has made me so passionate about the benefits of music therapy and what it can do for people. Gosh, what an awesome story. Yeah. Thank um, you. Not to go on a total tangent, but I know that you have these young kids. So on a scale of one to a puddle of tears, <laughs> could could you even make it through Coco? Oh, Coco. Because <laughs> you just basically described poor little Miguel's I know. Little moment of lucidity with his sweet grandma Coco. I know. I know. It's so true. Yeah, that one hit me in the feelings really, really hard. And luckily, I've been a little bit desensitized to it because my kids love that movie and we watch it mm. so much. Actually, my son, <laughs> when my daughter was was little, um, like when she was two, she couldn't say Parker, but she would say Coco. And so <laughs> she would call him Coco. So now oh. that's my nickname for him. I call him Coco all the time. And so, yeah, he's my little Coco and we watched that movie a whole lot. And yeah, that was watching that was like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm. (laughs) My little daughter who was born in Orlando just always does her. She runs around the house doing her little grito. The She's always (laughs) doing that around the house. Um, Well, to kind of find out a little bit more into what you're doing now, how how soon did you open up a business and kind of decide this is what I'm going to do? Because you have such a unique and strong voice that I think you've been contributing to the greater music therapy conversation for a while. The first time I heard you was the round table podcast, I think. Yeah. Um, And which you all were one of the first, if not the first music therapy podcasters. So how did you, What was that initial road? And then how did you start to find your own personal voice? You do a lot with, you know, writing songs and encouraging people to write songs. So what was that early stage and how did that transition into what you're doing now? Yeah, I think I always had the entrepreneurial spirit. And that was something that I knew going into grad school that I wanted to do. I wanted to eventually start a private practice and kind of explore what are my options within this world of music therapy? What are all the different things that I can do? Because to me, even at that stage, it felt like this open field that I could just really kind of spread my wings in. And after my, actually midway through my internship, I ended up getting a full-time job as a music therapist at a school here in Springfield where I'm from. And so I was lucky to have that job security even before I finished my internship. But at the same time, you know, kind of had it in the back of my head. Well, someday I want to start that business and I want to have a private practice. But for now, let's, you know, save up some money and do something that's very um, safe and that Mm -hmm. I feel like is going to support me in these early years and really give me a footing as a music therapist. Well, it was not even the first week of starting that job where I started getting phone calls from people in the Springfield community that had heard that a music therapist was coming because I was the only music therapist here in town. The only one that lived here. There was a, there was a small um, contract at one of our hospitals that a music therapist traveled for. It was like a four hour per week contract, but, Mm. um, but I was the only one that was here full time And so, you know, me being young and naive and just like, hey, let's do, you know, whatever comes my way. I 
I said, oh yeah, I can, I can start a private practice while I have this full-time job. And I'm also like figuring out life as an adult. Sure. Yeah. I just did 32 (laughs) credit hours like a year ago. I'm totally good. Right. Exactly. Like if I can do that, I can do anything. Right. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I started taking on private clients. So I would go, I would work for seven and a half hours of the day at my school job. And then I would go drive client to client, house to house and work with clients um, after school, Monday through Friday. And it got to the point where I was working lots of hours every day. And I was getting home at like nine o'clock at night and I was exhausted and it was just a lot. And so I went through many iterations of the private practice. Eventually, um, my husband and I, well, we got married and then we moved into a new house specifically because it was set up perfectly to have a home-based studio mm-hmm. for my private practice. And for the next mm, like six years or so, I saw clients in my home. And after the first four years of my job at the school, I ended up resigning from that position. I had an intern that last year and she ended up taking over that position so that I could pursue full-time music therapy, Mm. private practice. And I also kind of knew in the back of my head, you know, I want to have kids eventually. And I really just wanted that, that lifestyle where I was setting my own hours. I was really in charge of what my day-to-day looked like. And I didn't have that freedom at my school. And, and that, that was a struggle for me because I really liked Mm. my work. I liked my colleagues. I loved my students there, but I needed I needed that flexibility and that that feeling of freedom. So the private practice continued to grow and um it was actually in the first year of my job um as a music therapist at the school that I started blogging and that I started podcasting and doing all of those things. And again, it was really just I'm young, I don't know what I don't know, and so I'm just going to put it all out there and that's exactly what I did. And I think that had I waited and had I done that further down the line, Mm. I would have been much more hesitant and I wouldn't have so freely, you know, spread, (laughs) spread the word about what I was doing and tried to, to gain more of a following and more of a readership. But I had youth on my side and, and just that whole like innocence of, you know, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. And it worked out really well. It's that all of that has grown since I started it. I mean, that was 2008. So it was a long time ago. And to see the landscape and how things have changed in the music therapy world, as far as the different things that people are doing and the resources that people are putting out there, I think it's really exciting. And to, to think that, oh, you know, maybe I had a small hand in that and being one of those early pioneers of that is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's literally already on like a, a third wave of music therapy podcasts. So I some know. people are just finding out about them and I'm like, guys, this, this is like the third crew that's <laughs> come through. Like I there's know. already a lineage in internet world is like a long time ago. Absolutely. So then tell me a little bit about all of your different businesses. I I was reviewing a little bit about all you do and I think I don't even know how you how you can break down everything <laughs> that you do. Um but for someone who's hearing about music therapy maybe multiple times on this podcast and thinking I'd like to do that and then oh wow, you can do all the things you're doing. So what, what clients are you working with directly? What populations are you working with? And then I know you're doing a ton of other things and you just wrote a book about how to do all of those things. So (laughs) what are, what's the other pieces of the puzzle for you? So as far as my private practice, the evolution of that since it started in 2007 is just insane. Looking back, I mean, in the first five years, six years, no, seven years, it was me. I was doing everything. I was seeing every client. I was running every group. I was sending every email, sending every invoice. Literally everything was me. Mm. And um, back in the day, I was, um, there was a time 
I like to share this with my team and my, especially when I have new employees and talking about burnout and the fact that it's very real and that we Mm. need to be open about our caseload and about how we're feeling about it and how we're managing. Because at one point I had 60 either clients or students that I was seeing every single week. And that was not a healthy time for me. It was a very profitable time. But it was not sustainable. <laughs> but it comes with a cost of it, its own. Yeah. It came with a very high cost. Yeah, I had no time for anything but work. And I have a tendency to throw myself into work. I still do. But that was that was too much. It was over, over the edge. So I've learned how to kind of scale down a little bit, scale back. Um, but the early iteration of my practice was very one-on-one client-based. Um, I worked mainly with kids who had developmental disabilities. Um, I had kids that were diagnosed with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. I worked with groups at the autism program and the Down syndrome society. And then I also, I've always done early childhood groups. That's been kind of like a, a thread throughout my entire clinical career. That's kind of where my heart is, is with early childhood. And now so over the years, I've, I've gradually pared down my, my personal client load because with having kids and with growing other businesses and with growing this business, there's only so many hours that you can devote to direct service. Mm-hmm. And so now my team works with hundreds of clients. We have contracts all throughout Central Illinois in senior living facilities. We actually, our biggest client or our biggest contract is with the school where I started my career. Um, mm. After the music therapist there that took over for me, after she left, she, um, she pursued another degree. Um, I contacted them and I said, Hey, you need another music therapist? And they're like, Yes, we do. And that's when my team um, started providing services out there. So it's kind of that's come awesome. full circle. Yeah, that was a pretty cool moment. Um, but, but yeah, we work with so many different populations. We work with hospice, um, with several different school systems, early childhood. We also see individual clients here in, um, our studio. We teach early childhood, preschool, early elementary classes. We have music therapy groups and we also teach lessons. So aside from our five music therapists, we also have, let's see, 10 additional instructors that teach lessons. Yeah. So it's, it's so fascinating just to see the evolution of how far things have come. And a big part of that was in 2014. So after my son turned one, um, I brought on a co-owner. So um, Katie Camrad had been contracting for me for a couple of years And at that point, we were both kind of wanting bigger and better things. I wanted to move outside of my home studio because now I have this child that understands Mm -hmm. that when I go to work, I'm actually just right on the other side of the house. And that got really difficult. Um, So when Katie came on as a co-owner, we moved to a new facility and then we eventually out, well, we outgrew that within a year. And so we moved into um, our current facility where We've got, I think, about 3,000 square feet of space, um, which is just amazing. Awesome. <laughs> when I think about the the point we were at when we walked into this building, we thought, oh, my gosh, we're never going to fill this space. We actually just expanded into some of the space that was on the other side. Um, my husband and I actually bought this building um, in October. So that's been a really, really cool yeah. um, development. He owns a, an insurance agency. And so they're doing the build out on his side right now. And so he'll be moving in in March. And so we'll, I'll be on one side. He'll be on the other side. And it's kind mm-hmm. of like a like a family business combined. So that's kind of fun. Kind of a disaster or somebody uh, gets hurt, you're also really insured. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great. Exactly. That comes in very handy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, wow. I didn't know that this facility was such a 
a compound you're running here. That's awesome. Yeah, so, it's been really cool just to see the development of it and the need for it, I think, is the most exciting thing. Thinking back to when I was in, when I was a newly uh, board certified music therapist and everybody I met in Springfield was like, what? What's music therapy? Like, I've never heard of that. And to now I tell people what I do. Oh, you're the owner of Music Therapy Connections. Oh, I know. Da, 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 da. They go there. And it's it's kind of becoming a well-known landmark in Springfield, which is amazing. And I never thought that that would be the case, but here we are. Wow. So expanding out of just that private practice work, I know you've done a lot of other things. So what is your online presence, the listen and learn and all the other things yeah. What does that look like even on a daily basis? And then what are the offerings that you have? Yeah. So the other offerings that I have, Listen and Learn Music is almost as old as Music Therapy Connections, which is my private practice. I started them both around the same time, but I was writing all of these songs for my students and I was, and it, they were all very goal-based, very educational, all of these mm -hmm. like activities of daily living and um, cognitive skills and communication, all of these songs that I thought, well, gosh, I'm getting so much use out of them and my students are benefiting from them both in the school and in my private practice. Like, why not just put them out there? So I started this blog and this was in 2008 when Blogspot was pretty much the only blog platform. And so I started this Blogspot blog and I would just post my songs and I would share them. And I, I got so into just the whole process. I loved writing them. I loved recording them and putting them out there. And then to start getting feedback from other music therapists saying, hey, I love this song. I was able to use it. Here's how it went. Here's how I adapted it. That just, to me, fueled the fire of wanting to just keep going with that. And that fire has just gotten stronger over the years. And I still, that's, that's my love is creating these resources for other music therapists and not just music therapists, but also preschool teachers, early childhood educators. I even have parents that, that purchase the songs and that are part of my membership where people can access all of the resources in one place. Um, so that's kind of like the, the other main side. I've got Music Therapy Connections and then Listen and Learn Music. And those two things are really the centers of my attention. So most of my days are kind of split back and forth between those two businesses. Mm. And then what about your new book? What made you decide this was something you needed to be writing? And then how did it all evolve? Because you roped in a lot of other <laughs> awesome music therapists to talk about their background and all the cool things they're doing. So it seems like anything that you weren't already doing, you found the other people that were doing that and got, yeah. got them to talk about it as well. That was kind of my goal. Exactly. I, I felt just this call to write the book because early on, in my music therapy career, I struggled with the fact that I wanted to do things other than clinical work. And I felt like that was almost a taboo thing mm. in music therapy to want to do non-clinical work. And I didn't know if that made me less of a music therapist, but I also knew that what I was doing was really valuable and that it was helping people. And not only helping other people, but it was also fulfilling me and my love of music and combining my love of journalism. And I got that. I was able to kind of scratch that itch through the blogging that I've done for so long. Um, but all this time, I've kind of felt like, oh, you know, I bet there are other people out there that have the same conflict where you know, maybe they're at the point where they can't take on more clinical work. Maybe they're filled up to their eyeballs with clinical work like I was that one summer that I had the 60 clients. And maybe they're still they're still not where they're at, where they want to be at financially. And I know that feeling. I, I've been there too, where you only have so many hours in the day to fill up with clinical work. And that can be a struggle. And that's where I feel like we kind of head into burnout territory where we take on mm. a little bit more than, than is healthy. Also, I am a 
extreme introvert. I thrive on time spent alone doing my own projects. I love having a big team here at Music Therapy Connections and having colleagues that I can meet with on a weekly basis and then I can see, you know, multiple times a week. But it's really that like those days that I can just put my head down and dig into my work that fulfill me. And that's not always synonymous with clinical work. And so I really have found this amazing, I won't say balance because it's never a balance. You're always kind of juggling back and forth, but Mm -hmm. it just like what I explain it as is just this lifestyle where I'm doing work that I love. I'm helping people. Yes, directly with some direct work, not as much, not nearly as much as I used to, but then with the resources that I'm creating and with the, the listen and learn music and then now the book, having those other means of reaching people while also doing the work that I love to do, I wanted other people to have that too. And I wanted mm-hmm. other people to see that there are other ways to use all of those years of training and all of that money you spent on that music therapy degree. There are other ways to apply that that aren't necessarily clinical where you're trading time for dollars because you can only do so much of that. And Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I really struggled with, with putting this book out there. I, even up until the launch, I thought, gosh, are people going to think that I'm trying to turn music therapists against clinical work? Because that is Mm. so not the case at all. I think that clinical work is the is the touchstone of what we do. That's why we go into music therapy and that will never change. But looking at all of the other possibilities, it's just not something that is taught in school. And it's kind of like you have to teach yourself and you have to figure it out mm. as you go. And I spent so many years figuring it out for myself and wondering, am I doing this right? How can I do this more efficiently? And I would answer email after email and write all of these blog posts. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be helpful if I just put everything that I've learned and then also (laughs) pull in some of these experiences that other music therapists have had and put it all in one place. And so the book is, it's kind of a combination of my experiences, what I've learned through kind of diversifying my revenue streams and figuring out different ways to apply my music therapy education and skills. Um, And then it is a lot of how to. So I go through all of these different means of, of generating revenue. So I have um, one part of the book is devoted to offline. So in person, how can you make money by getting out into your community and collaborating with different people and doing all of these things that, that do require your presence. And um, then there's a whole other section of the book that is for online Ge- um, mm-hmm. income generating streams. So um, yeah, it's it's a really, it was really fun to write because it was kind of like, this is my life and I'm putting it all out there for you. These are all the things that I do. These are all my secrets basically. Yeah. And, and I just, I have this, this philosophy that you should just share what you know and you mm-hmm. should just put it out there because if people are drawn to it and if people are drawn to my resources, I, I give out so many free resources all the time and people say, Oh, why do you, you know, give out these things for free? And I say, you know what, if people want to pay for it, they will. And, and they do. And the fact that I give freely doesn't, doesn't reduce the, the amount of money that I make from people that are buying things. Um, I see the number of people that I've been able to, um, to touch and make a difference in their lives because I've been so giving with my experiences and I wanted to do that on a more accessible basis. So that was really the inspiration for writing the book. And, um, I'm so thrilled that it's the way that it's been received has been amazing. I haven't gotten any angry emails about turning music therapists against clinical work, which that was my big fear right there. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been amazing. And I, I think that it's helping people. At least that's what, that's the feedback that I've gotten so far. 
Well, I know it's not just an issue with music therapists. There's an issue across, I would say, any creative industry and especially the music industry of two things. For one, how come I didn't learn this in school? Or uh, because you see that all these these YouTubers and these content creators that are creating courses that are uh, creating their own small communities and different things like that and doing it the same as like you said, just grassroots. Nobody taught me this. I had to figure it out. And then the other aspect kind of to transition away from that is what do you say to the music therapist or the creative who doesn't know how to do things like charge what they're worth or feel brave to launch that endeavor like you're saying those those other ways you know they're scared of well i i thought i'm a music therapist why am i not just doing more clinical work right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah it's a mindset issue it and that was that was so tricky for me because i thought well this has to be wrong because they didn't teach it in school so if it wasn't in my curriculum then I must be doing something that's like off limits or that's, you know, not accepted in the music therapy world. And I did get some backlash in the early days for, um, and I tell this whole story in the book about the, I don't know if the list service to, um, Oh. early for you but no I, I I was on it as a student and I thought man this thing <laughs> is uh without a better word you know an an s show yes you know, like this is a hot mess it is brutal. Night, <laughs> right and then it just became music therapy it was the music. predecessor exactly Ooh. And then I was like, yeah, I'm just done with Facebook. And we I just know. decided that was like, now it's like, man, that was like five years ago. And now I'm starting a podcast. I'm like, oh, do I, do I have to get back on social media for this? I guess. The answer so. is no, not if you don't want to. At least, I mean, you're doing amazing on Instagram. I have to say your presence on Instagram is amazing. You don't need Facebook. So you're fine. <laughs> yeah. Facebook is the, uh, the old thing anyways. Exactly. Nowadays. Exactly. It's like your grandpa's on Instagram or on Facebook. So yeah. And they're <laughs> yeah. not going to listen to the podcast. Right. Anymore. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I had a terrifying experience on the listserv early on. Like yeah. I said, I was this like doe eyed young girl, like here I am. I'm six months into music therapy and I would love to share my blog with you. And um, yeah, it's, it's a funny story, but, um, Yikes. definitely got some pushback, but a lot of what I talk about in the book is your mindset and how important mindset is in going into these endeavors and doing these non-clinical things and figuring out what is your why, like, why are you doing this? Yes. You want to make more money, but is it because you have this creative passion that's not being fulfilled? Is it because you're a super duper introvert like me and you need that time to yourself and and you just can't devote any more time to that one-on-one um, giving? Because it is, it can drain you. Um, it can drain extrover- extroverts too, for sure. But as an introvert, having back-to-back-to-back-to-back clinical sessions is really tough. Um, so so I- that also means the documentation and that also means there's still yes. phone calls and emails to respond to. Oh, and absolutely. That's the, that's the part that I think drives me crazy is not the back-to-back sessions. It's like, but there's other things that also somehow still need to get done in these hours. Right. Like an hour long session is not just the hour long session. It's all the prep that goes into it, all the doc that goes after and everything in between. So it's, it's so much. And a lot of the things that I share in the book are, are explaining, like there are things that you can do that you can create that go out and then you can make money from those things down the line. I mean, I've been writing songs and putting songs out there and creating CMTE courses and these other resources that maybe I put that out there in 2011 and it's still making Mm -hmm. me money. And granted, I can't say that that's passive income because I still put the work in to to have a community and to um, market my my materials and to stay relevant. But but it's maximizing my effort so that they, it just keeps reverberating and mm-hmm. and earning income. 
But I, I think the mindset part of it is so key. And it's, I think it's just almost like you need that permission slip from somebody that has done it and that can tell you from like that ground level, like, yeah, this is something that you can do. And as far as charging your worth, oh my gosh, that I could talk for like six hours about that. I think most of us <laughs> music therapists could, especially those that have kind of been through it all and have run the gamut. Um, you know, I, I've done so many free sessions and free groups. And still today, I struggle with that. I've been a business owner for 13 years, and I still have issues with saying, nope, this is how much a session costs. This is how much an assessment costs. This is how much, you know, we will charge you. And it's just, it's about believing in, in what you're, you're doing and the value that you're giving and being able to back that up with, research and with your experience that you've had so far and with testimonials from people who have had your, had your services. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's something that can't be wrapped up in a nice, neat, like 60 second answer. It's messy. And if anybody does have an amazing answer for that, I would love to hear it. (laughs) And (laughs) yeah. Well, you hit on burnout a little bit and not to go too far in, but what do you think are some ways that people get back to their why and to protect themselves from burnout in, in music therapy, but it's also the same in teaching or nursing. I think a lot of helping professionals in general. So what do you, what is your advice for that? I think it's looking at two factors. It's looking at what lights you up and what fulfills you. And then on the other side, it's looking at what is feasible and what is logical as far as your life and your financial status goes. Um, I had a really tough time coming really close to complete burnout in 2015 when my daughter was just a baby and I had a full caseload. I was also growing this business. It was in a period where it was just kind of exploding and I had a toddler and I also had my online business and I was doing a weekly podcast at that time. And so I had all of these irons in the fire. And one day I remember I was home with my daughter who was an infant and I would go to work at three o'clock, a babysitter would come over and I would go work with clients from 3.30 to like 7.30 at night. And this was Monday through Thursday, every day. Um, And one day I just had this panic attack where I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't leave her. I couldn't go in. I couldn't work with my clients. There was no value that I was going to provide that day because my brain was just so fried and emotionally and physically I was just spent. Um, I wish I could say that I didn't go to work that day and that I just like took care of myself, but I didn't, I went to work and I pushed through, but that really caused me to kind of take a step back and say, do I need to be doing all of these clinical hours? Is it integral to the financial health of my family? Is it integral to my career? And at that time, I had to weigh, like, what is it doing to my mental health? Mm. And taking into account all these factors, um, the answer was, no, I can't do it anymore. So I spent the next year really significantly um, reducing my caseload, which was hard. I mean, any music therapist knows how difficult it is to let go of a client, especially one mm. that you've been working with for a long time. Um, but I was able to kind of see, okay, I've got this handful of lesson students that I've been teaching for seven years, five years, whatever, that I, I still have an attachment to, and we're still doing great work together. But I'm not a teacher first and foremost. I've been teaching because it's always just been part of what I've done. Um, So I let those students go. And of course, their families completely understood. It was sad and it was hard, but um, but it it made me more sane, which that was that was what I was going for. And over time, I was able to do that with 
a few more of my clients. And then having a team, I was able to look at, you know, what if this client started to work with this other music therapist and have a fresh perspective, a fresh approach that could be really good for my client. And actually Mm. one client in particular that I'm thinking of now works with one of our other music therapists. And I, I worked with her personally for eight years and she was one of the more difficult ones to, to let go of, but she is thriving with this other music Mm. therapist. And that's just so amazing to see. But I think it's also important to tell people that it's going to be okay. Like it's not the end of the world if you do have to reduce your caseload. And I know that's not, it's, it's not possible in every workplace environment. If you're not self-employed, if you're an employee of a facility or a school or somewhere, you might not have that say, but at least bringing it up and putting it out there and speaking up for what you need for your own mental health and Mm. um, what you can and can't handle. Because for so long, I didn't speak up about it and Mm. (laughs) I didn't speak up to myself. And I just finally had to get like brutally, brutally honest and and do what was best for me. Well, and I know that there is a lot of privilege in, in the, that statement of like agreeing, like, yes, some people might not have that ability, but my caveat to that is right now. Yeah. And I think you talked about, you know, 32 hour semester, 60 clients in a week. And I think, it's so much easier to handle whatever when you know it's a season rather than the burnout comes when is this forever? That is such uh, a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. So, oh, I was just going to say, you know, thinking back to when I worked at the school and I had this full caseload there. And when I had the full caseload with my private practice, I knew that I could get through that because that wasn't my forever. I knew that my goal was to to eventually work in private practice full time and that I had two years of this. And at that Mm -hmm. time, I didn't have kids. I didn't have all of the responsibilities that I have now. But then as it got closer, it was like, okay, I have one year left. I have six months left. I can do this. And I think that that is that is a huge statement that you made, that it's a season. And I think you can get through anything in a season. I mean... And it seems silly when you think of all the things that, you know, people have gone through when you look at life and history and it's like, well, I mean, certainly I can work and make money. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, burnout usually comes from good problems. So, And that is so uh, true. And that's exactly what I write in the book is that during that time when I had that panic attack, I just had too much of a good thing. I had this booming Mm. business. I had all these great clients. I had these two tiny kids and um, these online businesses. And it was like, yeah, they're all amazing things. But at some point you have to say, okay, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And every single piece at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You can't literally jam the cake down your mouth (laughs) exactly, and expect to still like it. Yeah. 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 Man. Well, I think this has been awesome. We've hit on so many good points and just to kind of transition into this last part is you've been talking about all about your business, all about your why, but I want you to kind of narrow in for the last two. And that is how and why do you inspire others to make more music? Ooh, for this I will go back to my roots, my early childhood roots. Mm -hmm. I was doing early childhood music groups while I was in grad school. I took over an early childhood group at my church because the person that was leading it um, was moving out of state. And so she knew that I was um, studying music therapy and said, I think this would be a great fit for you. And I ended up having that group for over 10 years. And I've kind of taken what I learned there and applied it to my own groups that I now have at um, Music Therapy Connections. But that is kind of the, the last remaining direct service that I do here. And every Tuesday and Wednesday, I work with these groups of little kids and their parents or their grandparents or their caregivers or whoever brings them. Mm -hmm. And every week I hear these stories of 
their mom comes in and says, oh my gosh, little Jenny was singing your songs and she got out her toy guitar and she was pretending like she was Miss Rachel and (laughs) she knows every single word to your polar bear song. And so for me, like seeing that spark in these little tiny kids that are just starting to talk and that are just starting to have these personalities for music to be such an integral part of that. And for me to play a role in making that happen, that for me is more important than any business that I could run, any book that I could Mm -hmm. write, anything else that I'm doing is giving these little kids that musical start in their lives and having it be something that they enjoy and that they can do with somebody that they love in their life, a a person that is important to them. I think there is nothing better than that, honestly. And, and I, I've seen these kids go from being babies in my class to then growing up and going all the way through our, our programs and then having being in lessons and music, just being a constant part of their lives. And so that I would say is, is really, really important to me. That's awesome. Well, it's been great to chat with you. I feel like this was kind of like Tim's. I feel like we could go on for another two hours and talk about other things, but I told him, I was like, well, I'm definitely going to bring you back later. So maybe later we can come back. And I had this awesome idea. I don't know if the rest of your, your gang would be up for this, but I want to make, whether it has me involved at all, I want a music therapy roundtable reunion. Oh my gosh. I think that is so needed. (laughs) I love that podcast. We did the podcast for six years and we had four co-hosts. So you can imagine four busy music therapists, business owners, parents. I I can't (laughs) imagine how how that actually happened. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I cannot. Yeah, it just it just got too hard, but I think we are due and we need to get together at conference. I think that's the most uh, feasible place for that to happen because we used to do a booth every year in the exhibit hall and we would record a live episode every year at conference. So I'm thinking a reunion is in the works for, maybe for um next conference. New Jersey. Maybe hey. you might hear, it might, you might've just heard that here first. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. Atlantic city, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yes. I am on board. Great idea. Let's, let's do it. I think you should do it. I well, agree. Um, it's been awesome to hear about, you know, your businesses and all the different ways that you're hoping to reach out and inspire other music therapists to think, Hey, you have all these skills. Let's use them. Let's get out there. So where do you want me to send people when they're surfing the World Wide Web to find out your stuff? Yeah. So I would love for you to check out the book. It's um, both a, it's a PDF and it's also an audio book. So you can also get it on Amazon and Audible. But if you go to my wow. website, yeah, You're on Audible? I'm on That's Audible. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, did you read your own book? I did. Audible? I did. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, it was fun. Um, but if you go to my website, um, you can either go to listenlearnmusic.com or you can go to musictherapyinnovator.com. You'll find the book. You'll find all of my resources, all of my songs, and um, all the stuff that I'm up to. And I, I love to connect with people. I get probably 100 emails a week from music therapists and preschool teachers and and educators. And I just love to hear what other people are doing with music in their variety of settings. And so um, I'd love to hear from you, from your listeners. Wow. That is awesome. Good night. A hundred emails. <laughs> that is. <laughs> and I maintain inbox zero most, most of the time. Ooh, and an introvert on top of that. That was That's the right. I want to. I think it would be cool to dig in later is talking about, you have a whole course about that. I, I do. Yeah. I didn't mention that, but I, I created um, a course called the introverts guide to thriving in an extroverted career. And it's mm. all about being a music therapist. I mean, it really could apply to any job where you are working with other people, but, yeah. um, but it's specifically for music therapists. It's a CMTE course. You can find it on my website, but yeah, it's, it's there. Well, we'll we'll have you back on later. We'll talk about the next big thing you're doing or something like that. But awesome. cool. 
Well, thanks again, Rachel. We're signing off. Everybody remember, give more grace, share more love, and make more music. All right, I told you that was another great one coming your way. If you enjoyed it, I'd love if you'd consider for free leaving a rating and review in your podcast player. It makes a huge difference and helps us get noticed. You can also follow us on Instagram at make.more.music. Join our music and wellness challenge that's going on right now. And ultimately, go pick up Rachel's book. Go check it out. Look at Listen and Learn Music. Look at Music Therapy Connections and just support her and what she's doing. I appreciate you. If you want to connect with me, you can do that at makemoremusicpodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, I'll catch you on the next one. Remember, give more grace, share more love, and make more music.